give you the digital anyway, but do you want a hard copy? You could have it. I'd just as soon have the electronic. Okay. Please. You can read that with us. <laughs> So I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Howard Leader, who is an expert in GMO crops. And he is a researcher. He's been doing this. Um, he considers himself a student of the soil, and he'll tell you more about that. But um, I've seen his presentation once, and I get to, I'm glad I get to see it again because there's so much information. So uh, please welcome Howard Leader. Thank you, Cindy. I was born and raised on the farm that I live on today and I officially started farming in 1979 but I fell off the horse the first time when I was three years old and I was milking cows when I was four so that you know that's probably when I started farming my father died in 1981 he had leukemia lymphoma and cancer of the bone marrow I had everything arranged or agreed upon and to take over the operation from him and he passed away a month after my wife and I got married and then came along the farm crisis of the 80s some of you may have heard of that some not that was a lot of fun we were just getting back on our feet and 1988 we had a drought that was a lot of fun 1989 I started using what was known at that time as alternative farming methods on our family farm today we refer to it as one of the references is biological crop production in 1989 I became a student of the soil I have absolutely no problem admitting the more I learn and the more I know the more I know I don't know the good Lord has given us an amazing creation to work with and when we in our very limited capacity and understanding understand part of it it's kind of like looking through a, a door with a that's very open just a little bit and you're way far away from it and it's a small light and as you get closer it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and as you're peering through there it just it turns into such a vast discovery that's non-stop and it's fun you get something new every day we used started in 89 we were fully implemented 1990 91 92 I decided to start sharing this information and products with other farmers that were interested that's when I began the uh, crop nutrition advisory work that I continue to do to this day and I can tell you I've been blessed in so many ways I can't count it to work with family farmers all across our country and the work that we have done in crop and livestock production focusing on alternative methods to do everything we can to get away from toxins and away from dependence on antibiotics and a lot of what we learned and what we saw caused us to pay closer and closer and closer attention well 1994 we heard about the promise of genetically modified organism crops and I'll refer to it both as GMO genetically modified organism or genetic engineering it's basically one and the same thing <clears throat> the promise was a tremendous draw and 
I started studying what I could find about it online and through different mechanisms and sounded a little bit too good to be true. As soon as we could research it on our farm, we started to research it and put it to the test. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. The things that we have seen at the farm level, hopefully you'll have a basic understanding of how it is designed and how it's working to this point in time. And the thing that really brought it all together was when the good Lord saw fit to connect me with all of these scientists, or most all of them. I have had the privilege and the tremendous pleasure of working with the majority of these in some capacity. There's a couple that I only reference their work, which is done cohesively with some other members on this team. Everyone on this list believes in the potential of the technology of genetic engineering. The potential will be tremendous when the technology is refined and perfected and implemented with the desired goals that are stated by those who are purporting it. And that will make more sense to you by the end of the presentation. I will take all questions that anyone will have at the end of the presentation to kind of keep the flow going, you know, jot your questions down. I won't leave until I answer the question. If I don't know the answer, I'll absolutely tell you I don't know, but I will take all questions. Some examples of a GMO. One of the first examples of genetic engineering to enter the food supply in the United States was known as RBGH or RBST. This is a genetically engineered growth hormone that was developed to be injected into lactating milk cows. This genetically engineered hormone mimics a natural hormone that is naturally present in the cow so they can't differentiate as to whether or not it was actually in the milk. And yet, the natural hormone didn't come with the side effects that this one did. The United States is the only country in the world that really allowed the use of this product. I remember when they did the safety testing on it in Canada, the first thing they required was the safety testing on the cows themselves and the safety testing verified the fact that when the cows were injected with this they had increased infection in their udder, mastitis, they had problems with their, the health of their feet and they didn't breed back well. The conception rates were down. They had to take them off of the hormone in order to get the conception because it was messing with the natural processes. There were a number of independent scientists that also voiced a concern that said this could be detrimental for women because of the potential changes in the progesterone and estrogen levels that could be in the milk as a result of this tinkering that was being done. There was never a full safety test conducted on that. But I can tell you that because of the concerns of the consumer in our country, the vast majority of the fluid milk today comes from cows that do not receive this any longer. Now it's still in the system. There are ice cream products and cheese and butter and dairy products that are in the system that come from cows that have been injected with this. And from the dairy farmer's standpoint, it's a benefit to him when those cows produce more milk. Of course, they had to deal with those side effects I mentioned, but the farmers are always challenged with the break-even or making money, so any shortcut that might be presented looks like a positive. Bacillus serenogensis is a natural occurring soil bacterium. The natural version of BT organic farmers have used for many, many years. 
They could spray it on their crop when they had an infestation of certain pests. The corn borer would ingest this BT toxin. This toxin eats a hole in their gut and they die. The toxin then returns to the soil in a benign manner and is no longer threatening. With genetic engineering they are trying to mimic this but they're doing it differently. They develop different strains of this BT toxin and they inject it into the plant so it's expressed in every cell of that plant. It's not like a pesticide that is sprayed on that can be washed off. It is in every single cell of the plant. Another example of this in-plant insecticide is known as CRW. It was specifically designed to help control corn rootworm. There are further versions of the BT and the CRW for differing insects that continue to come up as a problem in crop production as the insects are adapting to these unnatural alterations in the crop. Herbicide tolerance is the number one most widely adapted form of genetic engineered crop use in the world. The herbicide tolerance means they can insert a trait or a characteristic into this crop now we can spray a herbicide on there, for example, a glyphosate based herbicide. Glyphosate is the active chemical ingredient in Roundup herbicide, the most widely used herbicide in the world. By having that herbicide tolerance in that plant, that enables them to spray that crop with this herbicide that's designed to kill everything it touches. The crop survives and the weeds are gone. So to the farmer, it was a tremendous drawing card. It looked like a simplistic, easy, fast, simple way to go. We have glyphosate resistant soybeans, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa in production in the United States today. There's also something known as Liberty Link corn. The Liberty Link corn has a different active ingredient than glyphosate. It's glufosinate. It, the chemistry is slightly different, and the, but the approach of the herbicide is the same. It's designed to kill everything it touches with the exception of the genetically engineered crop that's designed to withstand it. The goals of genetic engineering, the number one goal that we've been told is to increase the yields of the crop to feed the world's growing population. I doubt that anybody would argue with that as being a novel goal. Another goal that we have been told is we're going to improve the nutrient content of the crop so that we can hopefully solve some of the illness issues and in the case of the improved nutrient content, the poster child of this has been the golden rice. Well this has been talked about from day one. It still is not developed and finalized and in production. The golden rice, the objective was to increase the vitamin A content of that crop and that by doing so, then this would enable us to introduce that rice to the poor countries where rice is a staple crop and as a result, this should help subside some of the blindness in the poor children. Well, there's two things, three things actually on the golden rice that we have to analyze a little bit from this perspective. Number one, they did slightly increase the vitamin A content in the rice. But you need to consume 20 to 25 pounds of rice per day in order to get the vitamin A level that they're purporting that this is going to solve the problem. The golden rice has not performed agronomically. It does not compare with the conventional varieties that the farmers are currently using so it's not going to have an appeal for them to want to use. The other thing that's happening, the mothers in the third world country of these children do not want anything to do with it because they have not conducted transparent safety testing on whether or not it would have an adverse effect to the children. And I guess I can't blame them for not wanting their children to be used as guinea pigs. 
There are, we're also told we will have drought tolerance with genetic engineering. The in-plant insect protection with the BT and CRW, the goal of that is to reduce insecticide use, and I don't think anybody would argue with that approach. The herbicide tolerance, the goal of that is to reduce herbicide use. Improve weed control, as I mentioned. This absolutely happened in the beginning. So let's review some of what has taken place. As far as increased yield, in the very early years of the introduction of the genetically engineered crops, our land-grant universities had access to the seed. They could have the conventional variety and the genetically engineered variety to put into test plots and do comparisons. <clears throat> Today, they don't have that capability. Because of the restrictive language on the technology agreements by the company that owns the patent on that seed, the researchers cannot access it without express written consent. We know of more than one instance where the research has not come out advantageous towards the genetically engineered crop and the researchers are not allowed to release that data. But in the early days when it was allowed to compare, there was something known, come to be known as yield drag. The University of Nebraska had multi-year testing to document this. The conventional soybean was traditionally yielding more than the genetically engineered. It was an 8 to 10 percent yield drag. The Union of Concerned Scientists in 2009 studied all of the data that they could access that was conducted at the research level in them early years. And they put out a report entitled Failure to Yield. They documented the fact that as much as 93 percent of the time the genetically engineered would yield less, sometimes it was the same and one or two percent they would see increases. On our farm in northwest Iowa, we had access to BT corn for the first time in 1997. <clears throat> the seed company provided this seed for the test plot. We have never signed a technology agreement for any genetically engineered seed. And we put this in a, a plot side by side, and it, it's very fine print. You probably can't see it from the back, but I'll explain the important parts. Our old reliable hybrid was Golden Harvest 2390. We put that in the field, and right next to it, we put the BT version. Our seed cost was over $10 an acre higher for the BT. The yield of the conventional was 149 and the BT was 146 so it was three bushels less but the biggest difference that year was the moisture difference the harvest moisture of the BT was five percentage points wetter as a result that cost us money you have to take a dock on that moisture when you sell that grain and it cost us 25 cents a bushel so the end result was we lost fifty seven dollars and ninety nine cents an acre as a result of using that BT. We also did another little experiment with that corn that first year. We had heard from the early use of BT in Nebraska that the cattle shied away from the BT stalks and the BT corn. So we took some of the conventional corn and some of the BT and put it in the opposite ends of the feed bunk and we turned a couple cows in there. They consumed all of the conventional corn and they smelled the BT and walked away from it. That's not normal for a cow. <laughs> the following year we repeated this test plot. We got the seed again from the seed company. We had the conventional and the BT. Again ten dollars an acre difference in seed cost with the BT being higher. The moisture was pretty close to the same that year but the conventional yielded 167 bushels per acre and the BT only made 140. Well, back in those days, corn was only $1.80 a bushel, so that calculated into a $58.95 per acre loss. This was one of our old reliable favorite hybrids. It was really bred well. The plant breeders did a super job of dotting their I's and crossing their T's. If you do a good all-around job of developing a hybrid, it will have natural pest tolerance in it in a big way. 
This hybrid had natural resistance and tolerance to corn borer and the BT didn't pay. The seed company had other hybrids who some of my customers referred to as corn borer magnets. And it kind of made you wonder, did the plant breeder dot the last I and the last three, four T's, or did they take a shortcut? If they put the BT into that type of hybrid, they would see a 10 or 15, maybe even 20 bushel yield increase, depending on the year and the amount of pressure you had from the insects. <clears throat> if they had a shorter path to take to get it to market, and a little higher priced seed which improved their margin, which one do you think they may be promoted? Herbicide use rates. As I said, glyphosate tolerant crops are the number one used herbicide tolerant crops in the world. Roundup herbicide was the only option for this in the beginning. 1974 was when Roundup was introduced and patented as a herbicide in 1994, that patent wore off, so they have 20 years protection. Once that happened, then there were all sorts of generic versions that came into being. The original use rate of that original formulation is 32 ounces per acre. That's what was used in the beginning. The farmers didn't use a pre-emerge and a post-emerge herbicide. They, in many cases, if they were tilling, they would make a simple tillage pass prior to planting, plant the crop, the crop came up, they sprayed the crop and the weeds, and the weeds all died, and life was good. Herbicide was cheaper in the beginning. By 2010, with continued use of this same herbicide, the weeds were becoming harder and harder to kill. In 1996, I knew of farmers in West Central Ohio that were applying 96 ounces of a glyphosate based herbicide in a single application and would put two to three of those applications on some soybean fields to try and tr control weeds that they were not able to kill. Dr. Charles Benbrook from your state did a study. He looked at the records and he looked at all of the pesticide use in our country before the introduction of genetically engineered crops up to, up to and through that 13th year. Over that 13 year time period, there, overall in the country, there was a quarter pound per acre increase in overall pesticide use. But in the 13th year, he looked at the conventional crop and the genetically engineered version, and there was a 26% increase between the two in that year because as we went forward, the need for more pesticide continued to increase. He then did a 16 year that looked at from start to finish and that saw, gave us a 7% increase of total pesticides in the country. In Argentina, they introduced the glyphosate resistant soybeans in 1996. They were using two liters per hectare. By 2010, they were up to as high as 20 liters per hectare because they could not control the weeds. The insecticide use before genetically engineered crops were introduced, there was no such thing as an insecticide treatment on corn and soybean seed. The soybeans came as we would know as naked seed today with no treatment on it. The corn had just a mild fungicide treatment on it. Today, it is just about impossible to get a genetically engineered seed in corn or soybeans without a neonicotinoid insecticide treatment on it. The neonicotinoid insecticides are systemic. That insecticide will be in the plant after it sprouts and grows from that seed and any insect that may feed on that plant in a three to four month time period is at risk. Neonicotinoids have been banned in several of the European Union countries because of the direct scientific proof that they are contributing significantly to the colony collapse disorder in honeybees. There is also research being done now that's looking at glyphosate, glyphosate as being a significant culprit in colony collapse disorder. What about the problem insects that we were going to control? This is a picture of a corn plant. 
You see the leaves and the stalk, here's the emerging ear, but there is no silk coming out the top of that ear. The reason for that, these are adult rootworm beetles. The adult rootworm beetle lays the egg for the rootworm larva. <clears throat> we all know the chicken came before the egg, so that's why I start with this one. The larva will be in the soil, or the egg will be in the soil. When the soil warms up enough, the egg hatches, then the larva comes out and chews on the roots of that corn. As you can see, this corn is not standing up. The reason it's not standing up is because it has no root system. That rootworm larva have chewed off the roots, and the corn is suffering dramatically. When the, after they go through their stage as a larva, they advance to the adult beetle. They go through a cocoon state. They come out as the adult beetle. If they chew all the silk off, then it can't catch the pollen. With no pollen, all you get is a cob. There's no grain to harvest. There are CRW resistant, that's the, the term for the in-plant genetically engineered insecticide. There are CRW resistant rootworm in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Illinois. There was just another article in Reuters published the 28th of August further documenting how widespread this has become in Illinois. The farmer, the, their corn is literally severely damaged as a result of these bred up insects. In our part of Iowa, a lot of the farmers have recognized that this trait is failing. So they have gone back to applying the in furrow insecticide when they plant the crop and in many cases they're applying higher rates than what we ever did before because of the resilience of the insect. So what is the motivation? Is it to grow more food? Is it to enhance the nutrient content of the crop? Technology fees are the royalties that the seed companies collect on every single bag of genetically engineered seed that a farmer purchases to raise a crop. He pays that, that royalty on every bag of seed every year. In the beginning I showed you the BT and that difference was approximately ten dollars per acre. That changed. By 2010, it had escalated to quite a level. And it hasn't slowed down tremendously since then, but in 2010, I thought, I'm going to sit down and figure this out. I presumed, you notice I said presume, not assume, I presumed that all of the acres in the U.S. would be planted to the latest and greatest technology seed for corn, soybeans, cotton, canola, and sugar beets. And I figured those tech fees based on the planting rate in the given crops. Now, the planting rate was in the 80 to 90 percentile range, so my numbers are going to be a little bit high. But I, again, to have consistency, I wasn't going to guess at the planting rate. I just said, what if we planted 100%? That year in corn, we had 87.9 million acres of corn. The technology fee or the royalty per bag of corn amounted to $60 per acre. The seed cost was only $40 per acre. So figuring that, at 87.9 million acres, that generated 100% of the acres again being planted, $5,274,000,000 tech fee. Soybeans, we had 78.9 million acres. The tech fee rate was $24 per acre. That was just under $1.9 billion tech fee. Cotton, we only had 10.9 million acres and the tech fee was $78 an acre. So that added $850 million. The history on cottonseed, I had the good pleasure of working in Georgia from 2010 to 2012 with cotton producers. And I learned a lot. In 1993, a 50 pound bag of cotton seed, the retail price was 45 to $60 per bag. 
In 2010, they no longer sold a 50 pound bag of cotton seed. They're selling 230,000 seeds per bag, and that bag would weigh from 38 to 46 pounds depending on the size of the seed. Here's the breakdown on the price. The seed cost is $159.99 per bag. The technology fee is $412.20 per bag. The seed treatment is $125 per bag. This is a combination of insecticide and fungicide and pneumaticide that they have to have on the seed because they have damaged so many of the beneficial attributes in the soil. They have every seed-borne pest and fungal disease attacking the plants and they have to use the toxins to present them, protect them. The total retail price then is $697.19 compared to $60 in 1993. Continuing on then with the total sugar beet, we only had 1.2 million acres, but it was $80 an acre, so that chips in 96 million. Canola, we don't raise a lot of canola in the United States. The bulk of it, of course, is raised in your part of the country. That was only $7.5 an acre, and the bulk of the canola is raised in Canada. I never did the numbers on that. I stayed in the United States. So if we subtotal all this for corn, soybeans, cotton, canola, and left out alfalfa as that was deregulated again in 2010, we total up to just under $8.7 billion worth of tech fee in one year for the United States alone. That does not include seed, fertilizer, chemical, or any other inputs that the farmer is going to purchase to raise a crop. Do you see a possible motivation? <laughs> we have been told by proponents of GM technology that this is just an accelerated process of hybrid development that we've been doing for thousands of years. It really upsets me when I hear that come from someone at one of our land-grant universities who absolutely knows better. Now it's true, we have been improving our genetics for thousands of years, but the techniques that are used from genetic engineering haven't been used for thousands of years and I'll show you why and how. It's absolutely untrue when they say this. How does it work? A foreign gene is shot or inserted into the DNA of that plant. They have absolutely no control as to where it will end up. When they do this insertion to this point in time with the technologies that have been implemented for the crops that we have in production, they may use a virus such as the cauliflower mosaic virus. They have to have a mechanism to get full infection of every cell of all of the DNA to get this expression they want. The example would be, I want a herbicide tolerant crop. If I don't get full infection throughout that whole plant, I could have that herbicide tolerance in the top part of the plant, but not the bottom. So I spray the herbicide and the top part lives and the bottom part dies, we're in trouble. In addition to that virus, they will purposely develop a bacterium that is resistant to, genic, to uh, antibiotics. They have a genetically engineered antibiotic resistant bacteria that they insert that's used as a marker to dictate where have we put this in the plant. They will also use an agrobacterium. An agrobacterium is basically a cancer cell of the soil. This is also used as an infection mechanism and they have also used E. coli, components from E. coli to infect and get this establishment of this characteristic in the plant. The European Food Safety Authority analyzed 85 different genetically engineered crops for the presence of a foreign virus. They documented that 54 of these 85 crops that they analyzed ha had the presence of an unspecified and un 
denoted, they're supposed to tell you what they're putting in there when they do this. 54 of the 85 had a foreign virus entity present in the crop. I had the good fortune, uh, fortune of having a molecular biologist attend the meeting I did in Pasco last week. She had just retired and she had done thousands upon thousands of these genetic insertions. I had said in my presentation that the chance of getting this in the same place twice was one in a hundred thousand. And she said to me, Howard, I would like to add to that. I would like to correct you. I said, I'm all ears. She sent me this slide and she sent me the math on the next page that she uses to illustrate the accuracy of the insertion of the foreign gene that is conducted in every genetically engineered crop. I'm not going to go through all the numbers, I'm just going to go straight to the bottom. Okay. She has what the, it, it's, she uses it, illustrates it as a grumpy gene. Well, the reason that that would be very applicable is the presence of all the infection mechanisms that they have. There's from a thousand to ten thousand DNA fragments per cell. You got to get all this covered. So when you do the math, and she did it, and I won't bore you with it, but she actually gave me a more updated figure after she sent this because she, she sent me another email and she says, I got to thinking about this. I didn't go high enough. But I stayed with the trillion because everybody's familiar with that. That's what our deficit is, so we know that number real well. <laughs> one in a trillion or one in a hundred trillion is the percentage chance that you're going to get that placed in the same spot. And you're going to see pretty quick why that's important. Every time there's a new genetically engineered crop development developed, there's the possibility and the presence of a new novel or foreign protein as a result. What's the effect of this? Well, first of all, let's think a little bit, what is the, the goal of raising crops? To provide a food source for mammals. So, how many mammals are there? There are 5,399 other subjects in this experiment with you and I. We're the two-legged version. Side effects. As I mentioned, in 1992 I had the good fortune of starting to work with farmers all across the country. Customers in crop and livestock production in 12 states. A customer in Nebraska was convinced by his seed salesman to plant his first BT corn. He planted enough to where he could fill one grain bin so he could keep it separate. He went to grind feed for his sows and the ration was for the conception ration. He was going to turn the, the boar in and have them bred. He was used to a 95 to 98 percent conception rate on his sows. That, that ration his conception rate dropped to 65%. He had a 30% reduction in his conception rate. He called the vet, the vet came out, they did blood tests on the sows, they checked the feed for mold and mycotoxin, they couldn't figure anything out. He called me and he said, what do you think? I said, don't feed the BT, we've heard some issues. So he took it out of the ration. He went back to the conventional corn, his conception rate went back to 95 to 98 percent. He went along fine and he thought, I really need to pull some corn out of that bin again. That probably won't happen again, so he ground from that BT bin again. The second time his conception rate dropped 70 percent. That was the last time he ever used BT corn in his sow ration. In South Dakota, we had a different operation with a different BT corn. They had ex explicit records. Everything was computerized. They knew every pound of this and that that went everywhere. They knew their production records. If they didn't have such a tight production control on everything, they might have missed what happened to them. When they fed BT, 
their litter averages was down 1.6 pigs per litter. The weight of the piglets when they were born was also lighter. We go to West Central Iowa, a different BT corn. This gentleman planted the bulk of his whole farm to it because the seed salesman said it's the thing that you want and need. The only thing he had was his buffer corn which was very diluted in the mixture of all this BT. He had something known as pseudo pregnancies. The sows appeared to conceive, they would go full term and upon delivery all they delivered was a sack of water in the afterbirth. The veterinary started working on this problem they got the university involved. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. They did blood work. They tested the feed. They checked for everything under the sun. He was a Farm Bureau member. The Farm Bureau spokesman came out and did a story on his problem with his livestock. When that article came out in the Farm Bureau spokesman, he starts getting phone calls from farmers in the surrounding counties. They were all having the same problem at varying degrees. As if farmers put their heads together, they realized they were all feeding the exact same BT corn to their sows when they had the problem. The university was enabled to find any possible connection between that BT corn and the problem, but when all the farmers quit using that BT corn, the problem went away. In our part of Iowa, when the genetically engineered feedstuffs went into the ration, we saw ileitis, salmonella, and bloody bowel in the pigs. As, as we were able to control this with antibiotics or other measures, every so often you'd lose a pig. Every time we did a post-mortem on that pig, we would find ulcers in the stomach of the pig. We also saw consistent immune system disorders in these pigs. This foreign protein that is the result of every genetically engineered crop can have a devastating effect in the digestive system or a subtle effect depending on the host mammal. We have seen it consistently cause severe inflammation. The immune system. Now your immune system is your defense mechanism. Your, your immune system is supposed to protect you. 70 to 80 percent of the cells of your immune system are in your digestive tract. Now I want you to imagine that I am your immune system. I am in your digestive system. I realize it's a little hard to stomach but bear with me. I gotta throw a pun in there once in a while. You have consumed something that I have identified as a foreign protein and it just happens to be this post. It is my job to protect you 24-7-365. Now I want you to imagine you leave here and you come back at 10 minutes to 4 tomorrow. What is going to happen to my strength in that time period? Are we seeing an increase in autoimmune diseases in our country? 80 plus percent of the food supply contains ingredients from genetically engineered crops containing foreign proteins. Do you know anyone with an issue related to the immune system? That brings me to a point in time that I'm going to show you some pictures of hog stomachs. The pictures are a little graphic but no one has ever passed out. These ladies thought they had to come back for more from last night. <laughs> Thank you for coming. On this journey that I started in 1989 we developed a natural meat program and we got to a point in time that okay we needed volume customs processing of these animals. So eight miles up the road from my place, there's a, a processing plant known as Supreme Pack. And they do custom processing for a whole bunch of different niche pork companies. Many of which, they were drug free. But in their drug free program, they had no restrictions on feeding genetically engineered feed. 
at the time I took these pictures, 75 to 80 percent of the corn in our area was genetically engineered, and 85 to 90 percent of the soy was genetically engineered, so it was safe to presume that they were eating genetically engineered. We went to the plant to take the tour. Dr. McGuire was the veterinary that gave us the tour of the plant. And while we were waiting for him to come to the conference room, I was talking to the plant manager, and he says, well, what's different about your natural pork to, compared to everybody else's? And I said, well, we don't use antibiotics. We don't use hormones. We don't use animal byproducts, which was the same as everybody else's. And we do special things to the soil and, and prove there's no chemical residue in the soil and no chemical residue in the crop. And we absolutely would not have anything to do with genetically engineered crops. As I made that statement, Dr. McGuire walked in, and then I went on to explain the potential development of the irritation, inflammation, or ulcerations as a result of these foreign proteins. And Dr. McGuire got a real funny look on his face. And, you know, I'm, I have that effect on people, so I just kind of <laughs> sloughed it off. He took us through that plant, and he showed us everything they do with every single part of the hog. At one point in time, we go through this door, he turns and he washes his hands in the sink and he sprays disinfectant on his hand and he picks a hog stomach out of the container that they were in and holds it up so that I could see the fundus den. Well, I worked for a veterinary for eight years when I got out of high school, so I was familiar with what the inside of an animal looked like. Right away, I saw the irritation and inflammation even though that stomach wasn't opened up. So they allowed me to come back and take pictures of hog stomachs. I took 10 pictures of hog stomachs from our program that was multi-generational, no GMOs, and drug-free. I took 10 pictures of what I'll call a natural, which was a drug-free program but no restrictions on GMOs. 10 pictures of a B natural, which was drug-free, no restrictions on GMOs and 10 pictures of hog stomachs from pigs that were fed antibiotics the majority of their lifetime. I have put two of each in here for the sake of brevity. Dr. Newman is the veterinary I worked for for eight years. He was semi-retired at this point in time and he was the only person of the vets that I showed these pictures to that knew what a healthy hog stomach with was looked like because the other vets that I showed these pictures to that had the redness had been seeing it for the previous 10 years. So if you see something all the time, what do you call it? This is the first one of the healthy hog stomach. Notice the overall skin tone color of that stomach. This yellow over here is normal. That will be present at varying degrees in some or more of the pictures. That is there as a result of the enzymes and the amino acids still being produced, but there's no feed there to digest. This is the second one of the 10 on our program. There's a little bit of irritation right in this area right here. You can see some slight pink. This is one that is very representative of all the A natural. You can see the overall pronounced irritation inflammation and there is a pinpoint ulcer right there. This is the worst one of the A natural. The irritation inflammation is pronounced confined to this area and there are uh, some, there's pinpoint ulcers here, here, and here, and about a three to four centimeter ulcer there. This is one that is representative of the B natural. This is the worst one of the B natural. As you can see, the overall inflammation is worse. Pinpoint ulcer, pinpoint ulcer, 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 ulcer. Another series, here's some, there's some down here and about, there's about a five to six centimeter ulcer. This is one that is pretty representative of the antibiotic fed hogs. You notice how it has a pale appearance compared to the others. Dr. McGuire was quick to point out to me the benefit of the antibiotic it will reduce the irritation and inflammation but there is an ulcer dead center. It still didn't stop the full potential effect of that foreign protein. This is the worst one of the 
drug-free animal or the antibiotic-fed animals that we took a picture of. I called all of this information that we had I've shared with you up to this point in time coincidental and circumstantial. I was working with Dr. Ingham that time on many soil projects and I told her about this and she said, Howard, that's anecdotal from a scientific viewpoint. Now take it to the next level and set up the protocols and do the scientific study. So we did. The good Lord saw fit for me to connect with a scientist from Australia, Dr. Judy Carmen. She is the lead scientist on the, the scientific study that was published in a peer-reviewed journal in June of this year, the Journal of Organic Systems. We took 84 pigs right off their mother when they were weaned and they went on non-GM corn and soy. We took an equal number of male and female same size pigs, 84, and put them on GMO corn and soy and they were fed on those rations until the day they were harvested as a meat animal. When they were harvested, we collected all of their organs and all of the entrails in the animal and we took it off site and we had two licensed practicing, very experienced veterinaries do an autopsy on everything. We weighed all the organs of all the animals. We collected all this data and Dr. Carmen put it into the scientific statistical form. I hate them numbers so I don't even try to remember that form that she said. This is an example of what we saw of one of the non-GM fed stomachs. As you see, its overall appearance is the skin tone color. I will tell you that the pigs that we used were from a herd that were on GM feed because we couldn't find the volume we needed in a non-GM environment. These pigs also had PERS. It's P-R-R-S, all in capital letters. That stands for Porcine Respiratory Reproductive Syndrome. The veterinarians that are familiar with PERS and know a thing or two about human health, and by the way, our digestive systems are just about identical to that of a pig. PERS is almost identical to AIDS. I know a gentleman, and, and the PERS condition is prevalent throughout the pork industry in the United States. I know a gentleman in southwest Minnesota that has not fed GMOs since 2003. He is the only person in his neighborhood with a farrow to finish hog operation that has never had to repopulate his herd one, two, or three times because of PERS. They tell everyone PERS is an airborne disease and you have to have a $50,000 ventilation system on your buildings to protect your animals. You could throw a cat through the side of some of his buildings and it, that's how airtight they are. He's never had PERS. What happens when you challenge an immune system? Kind of like going up against a pole, isn't it? Another one of the GM, non-GM fed, excuse me, there is some irritation inflammation, which there was some in the non-GM fed. We used no antibiotics in this study. We had a 13% death loss. <clears throat> the industry claimed that we were terrible caretakers and we had bad husbandry because we had a 13% death loss. Well, we didn't say we had an antibiotic-free program, but the, 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 the study explained everything we put in the feed and there was no antibiotics listed there, so it was written down, but they just didn't catch it. The typical death loss for PERS would be 25 to 30 percent in a non-antibiotic environment. We only had 13 percent. This is an example of the severe inflammation that was expressed in a high statistical number of the genetically engineered feared animals. You see the red, there's also ulcer here, ulcer here, and ulcer here. We did not have a high incidence of ulcers, but we had a high incidence of that severe inflammation. The statistical findings, the genetically engineered fed animals were 2.6 times or 260 percent more likely to have severe inflammation in their stomach. 
of that, the males were 400% more likely and the females were 220% more likely. The other significant statistical finding, the weight of the utera of the female GM fed pigs was 25% heavier than the normal weight of the non-GM fed pigs utera. We did not anticipate finding that. If we would have, we would have been prepared and saved all the utera for further histological research. But remember I talked about conception issues and digestive issues that led us to doing this study. I've asked Dr. Carmen, she's an epidemiologist, I says what could this uter weight differentiation mean? She says well the first thing you think of is inflammation and swelling and then she went on to quote how many different names of how many different conditions that the name is that long that I don't try to remember. The thing that was the most interesting to me, not being a scientist, was the anecdotal information that we observed and were prepared for. We had to weigh these pigs every week. Dr. Pustai wouldn't let me get by without that. He helped us with our protocol. He said, you have to do that, Howard. I says, you realize how much work that is? He said, that don't matter, you have to do it. When they were small, we weighed them in a container on the scale, and when they were bigger, we chased them to the scale. We had a little corral set up, and they'd go through there, and it was like a, a simple maze. The GM-fed pigs could not manipulate this maze without confusion. They did it every week. Pigs are creatures of habit. In addition to being confused, they were irritable. They were biting and fighting and picking on one another. There was also an overall litness, listlessness in the GM fed animals. They were never content. <clears throat> Anecdotal, scientific, where's common sense? I look at these two facts and look at what's happening to the children in our country right now and I say where's the connection? Is anybody looking for the connection? We also saw skin issues, an eczema type or skin erysipelas type issue on GM fed animal. Thankfully that pig got over that without treatment while well, he did have treatment it, that was in the nursery when we moved him to the finishing the grow finish stage they were outside guess what the vitamin D solved that problem for him now we're shifting gears to beef a friend of mine in Ohio processes all his own animals on the farm he also processes for his neighbors he only feeds non GMO his neighbors feed GMO well, he's very observant, and he pays a close attention to a lot of things. As you see, the fat covering on this carcass is mostly white, and the fat covering on that carcass is dark yellow. The covering on the body cavity of the organs is mostly white, and the covering on the body cavity of the organs there is dark yellow. We're told if we consume a toxin, it will accumulate in the body fat. Which one of these do you think had a better diet as far as toxins were concerned and which one would you rather eat? I'm vegetarian. <laughs> Here's a graph that looks at inflammatory bowel disease admittances to hospital and discharges from 92 through 2004. It also looks at the implementation of genetically engineered soy and corn. You can see a correlation in the increase in both incidences. I will show you more information like this later in the presentation. Glyphosate is the active chemical ingredient in Roundup herbicide and numerous other generic forms of that herbicide. Glyph Roundup itself was patented as I said in 1974. At that time it was utilized for only one use 
as a burn down. They would apply that roundup to the field and kill all the weeds and grass that were present before they planted the crop. They had a clean start. No-till farming has been a definite benefit in a lot of people's operations and has benefited the soil. <clears throat> the other use then of the increased application of glyphosate comes with the genetically engineered crops that are tolerated to withstand it. You spray the glyphosate on the crop, the crop doesn't die, it absorbs a certain percentage of that chemical and retains it. The third use and probably the most significant increasing use of glyphosate herbicides today, it's used as a desiccant or a ripening agent on crops that are not genetically engineered. It is used on oats, wheat, rye, barley, edible peas, flax, forage sorghum. Some countries are using it on corn pre-harvest. In this instance of small grain, they may have mechanically swathed that grain when it was close to maturity, laid it in a windrow, and then came along and harvested it a week later. Now, they go out and they spray it with a glyphosate herbicide. Seven to ten days ahead of when they want to harvest it, it dries down and they come and they machine harvest it. What do you think happens to the glyphosate residue that they spray on the crop? This is a schematic provided by Dr. Bob Kramer, a USDA Ag Research Scientist at the University of Missouri. Dr. Kramer has done excellent work in looking at the effect of glyphosate on the plants and the soil. Glyphosate, first of all, Roundup, active and greeted again, works from foliar application. You spray it on the weed, it's systemic. It translocates to every part of that weed in a very short period of time. That's why it's been so effective as a herbicide. A minimum of 20% of the glyphosate that hits the foliage goes through that plant out into the soil through the root. That area right around the root is known as the rhizosphere. That's an area that's rich with microbial diversity. Many beneficial organisms will be present in the rhizosphere. It has been scientifically documented that glyphosate either severely diminishes or wipes out several families of beneficial soil microorganisms. In many cases, these beneficials are the control mechanism for the opportunistic or bad soil microorganisms that cause a host of plant diseases. The manufacture of the first glyphosate-based herbicide denied this for many years. They can no longer deny it because in 2010, they were granted a patent by the U.S. Patent Office on glyphosate. You can go on the Patent Office website and look this up. It's patent number 777-1736. And you will see that Monsanto was granted a patent on glyphosate as an antibiotic. As you start to read this, you will see it's registered for parasite control. But if you read down all the way through it, you will see at a tenth of a part per million, glyphosate will wipe out the vast majority of beneficial organisms that we need to have in our digestive system. When they registered Roundup, as a herbicide, they said it's not going to hurt humans because humans don't have a shikimate pathway, which is true. Plants do, but guess what? The microorganisms in our digestive tract have a shikimate pathway. And I will show you further information of how much damage they're doing in that regard. Glyphosate is also a very broad spectrum strong chelator. Chelate is a Greek word meaning claw or to hold. I have chelated this. I cannot pull it out. It is tied up. Glyphosate chelates, calcium, magnesium, manganese, zinc, iron, copper, nickel, cobalt, boron, selenium, molybdenum, and potassium. When it chelates it, it don't let go. 
It will chelate those nutrients in the soil. It will chelate those nutrients in the plant. It will chelate those nutrients when it's present in the grain. It will chelate those nutrients when it's in the plant residue. Glyphosate t attaches quickly to clay particles in the soil. They've tried to portray it as environmentally friendly because it does this. Well, the only thing that protects it from doing is leaching into the water supply, but the half-life of glyphosate, and that's the time that half of it shall be degraded and broken down and no longer a toxic compound, is from 14 days to 22 and a half years, depending on the soil conditions that you have present. This is all scientifically documented. There's no hearsay to any of it. I have told you that glyphosate is the most widely used herbicide in the world. Glyphosate doesn't kill weeds. Now you're thinking that's got to be the ultimate oxymoron statement anybody's ever made. It's the most widely used herbicide in the world, but it don't kill weeds. It has been scientifically documented four times that you cannot kill a weed or a plant with glyphosate if it's growing in sterile soil. These three pots had edible beans planted in them. This is the control. There was nothing sprayed on that one. This one is raised in field soil. It has a full complement of good and bad organisms, excuse me, present. This one's raised in sterile soil. They put that soil in autoclave and they killed everything in it. There's no good or bad bugs present. I didn't think you could even raise something in that type of soil, but you can if you have enough nutrition. You see how this one is stunted compared to that one? The way that glyphosate works, it stops the movement of the natural growth hormones within that plant. This will happen for about two weeks. That's the first step it takes to the demise of the weed. So it's like you put a brick on his head, he can't go nowhere. The next thing it does, it stops the flow of the enzymes and the amino acids within that plant that are designed to run the plant's defense mechanism. Plants don't have immune systems, they have defense mechanisms. So you shut down that plant's ability to defend it itself against disease. Remember I said the good organisms in the root zone are killed and the bad ones thrive? Well, you need a soil-borne fungal pathogen to cause a disease to kill anything that's been sprayed with glyphosate. Over here, it, this first picture is a corn plant that they purposely injected with anthracnose. Anthracnose is a disease that causes stock rot. The natural defense mechanisms of that plant kicked into gear and stopped the spread of that stock rot. You can see the, in, the insertion site, but it's walled it off, and that plant is viable. They split the stock in half so we could see this. On these, they also inserted the, thrac the anthracnose, but they sprayed it with glyphosate. That immediately shuts down all the enzymatic and the amino acid flow for that plant to defend itself. This was further demonstrated by another research product in Purdue. 